Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm excited today was a fun Q&A and also a little bit of talk about creativity and talking about playing with drones. Um, I'm working on some stuff coming out soon, I hope, with a bunch of drones and some ideas around working on creativity with drones, working on tuning, obviously, as well. But uh, so a little preview of that to come, some really great, great questions about staying relaxed, kind of building up tension, getting rid of tension, embouchure stuff. Uh, a lot of kind of a little bit technical trombone stuff. But as always, go down into the description. You can find all the time codes for your favorite questions. You can jump right to it and uh, get those questions answered and then leave a comment uh, with your question. So what are you thinking about? What are you working on this week? I want to hear from you guys. What's uh, holding you up? What's what's causing you stress? What's causing you um, problems in your practicing? I, w I would love to hear. So leave me a question and I will get to it in the next Q&A. Thanks as always for watching and uh, we'll catch you in the next one. But um, yeah, so I think the first thing we'll do uh, is just I wanted to talk about and set up and like how you can use drones to do two things, to warm up with creativity. That's what I want to talk about, like warming up with creativity and um, not just uh, sticking with your normal routine every time. Because yeah, I mean, it's cool. You can do your routine all the time. But sometimes you need to switch it up. Sometimes you need something new, something fresh. And we want to also exercise that creativity muscle at the same time. So what I like to do is set a timer or use like the length of a track. Maybe it's four minutes or five minutes or seven minutes. These are around seven minutes. So I'm not going to play the whole time for the whole, the whole drone track. But if I was doing it by myself, I would probably say, all right, I'm going to improvise. For this, this is seven minutes and 18 seconds. So I'm gonna, that's my constraint. I'm gonna just improvise in, in a key. So I, I've been putting together these different drones. And so I've got this uh, a synthesizer drone here that I'm gonna get going and I'm just gonna play. And so it's gonna kind of a warm up, and it's kind of a, an exercise in creativity. And so we're gonna kind of do both. It's kind of a meditation. I wanna make sure that we talk about that. I'm talking about exercising that creativity muscle, that uh, improvisation muscle outside of tunes because we often get bogged down in trying to play uh, other people's harmony. And sometimes we need to just practice hearing our own stuff. We're gonna do E flat. So the drone is in E flat.
sometimes, like I said, we get caught up in like harmony and trying to play harmony and trying to get slick playing harmony, like substitutions and this and that and the other things. So uh, to me, it's just a matter of being able, of having a wide variety of improvisational ideas, a wide range of improvisational landscapes, I guess, to go along with uh, the comments that Kevin was making. Uh, but just you have to practice just creating because I think uh, somebody asked, uh, I, I collected some questions um, this week about some potential YouTube videos to make about different things. And uh, I did that on Instagram and somebody was asking about the connection between improvisation and composition. And for me, they're just like 100% intrinsically linked because your your compositional and improvisational voice are almost one in the same other than that your compositional voice is just a little slower right and your improvisational voice is faster and happening in the moment but the the your brain and your ears are probably hearing a lot of the similar kind of stuff and so it's just like in time composition or out of time composition is how i kind of view it and how i think about it and how i think about developing a voice as a composer or as an arranger as a improviser all of those things just trying to uh, exercise my own creativity muscle this morning and do a little improvising with a drone so hopefully that might inspire you and like i said before like it's coming soon a new book course uh, of uh, drone exercises and drone creativity thoughts or things like that is what keeps you motivated these days not being satisfied i guess is the answer i guess i have um i don't know lofty aspiration aspirations i suppose and so those keep me focused on making small incremental improvement i'm trying to take better care of being happy with you know taking those small steps a lot of times sometimes i get frustrated that i'm not taking faster steps or bigger steps just trying to notch off some wins you know the win so for me like a win this week was that i arranged you know, three minutes of a big band uh, chart that I had been thinking about for years at this point, a couple, two, three years. I'm like, oh, this tune would be good to arrange. And I jumped in and uh, started getting that going. So it's not done, but <laughs> but at least that happened. So for me, that keeps me motivated, you know, taking those small steps towards big goals, you know, that creates momentum. And uh, so, you know, the big projects I have right now are just like, I'm trying to write music. I can't even decide what the ensemble is yet, but it's percussion ensemble versus with a jazz group of some sort. So that I've been just writing, I don't know, fragments of tunes, ideas for tunes. Uh, I've posted a couple times on Instagram, some little clips of stuff that I'm working on. And then um, compositionally, that is, I'm writing a, this book, taking my, all the, um, the workshops I've done cr called Create, Connect, Repeat and the Music Marketing Roadmap and all that stuff and turning it into a book called Create, Connect, Repeat, you can see right behind me. That's my philosophy for, uh, you know, music marketing and uh, career stuff. And just, you just have to keep on going, man. I've said it for a long time, this industry uh, in, in the jazz area, not so much in the pop area, I would guess, I would guess, but it's a game of attrition, as they say. What's your favorite composition from each record you've done? Oh man, on my first record, Exposition, my favorite tune is I like overexposure, like the last tune on the extra, the record. I've always had fun playing that one. That was one of the first tunes I wrote when I was like, I'm gonna have a band uh, of my with my name on it. I had a band before that, like a funk kind of fusion band that I co-led with a roommate in college. And uh, so I had a band all along, but um, to have a band with my name, that was the first tune I wrote, Overexposure. So that one kind of sticks with me. My favorite track on that record is actually the unreleased bonus track. Maybe I should release that. I haven't, I don't, I've never released it. It was based on a tourist point of view by Duke Ellington and it turned into a piece. My second record was The Chase, the title track, my favorite. It's really hard. Uh, that opening is uh, really hard to play, but I like it. It's good energy, a good challenge for improvisation. It's like, it's not just like changes or harmony, it's like uh, a whole kind of palette change you know like there's like three four and four four and and uh, a bunch of different characters within that it's a here and now i like um i like we the people uh that's a good one i i like um new beginnings but i don't get to play it very often i don't get to play anything very often at the moment i really want to try to get a regular gig somewhere sometime or get back on the road so we can play that music there's like 60 some charts in the book for that band and we've played all the tunes like i don't know five times maybe which is frustrating a little bit but the hits, you know, We the People gets played a lot. That's, so that's good. But I really like the arrangement of Single Petal of a Rose on there. Uh, if you didn't, And then if you didn't see uh, this week on YouTube, Wednesday, we released a new version of Single Petal of a Rose. So a solo version that is also cool. I've been playing that solo version for a few years now. 
wanted to get that recorded. I recorded one a couple years ago, but it didn't turn out super well. But this one I'm pretty happy with that we just released on Wednesday, if you want to check that out. But I really like the arrangement with the, with the bass clarinets and the trombones layered. That came out really well. Okay, No Arrival. I like the blues, the thing that opens it up. Well, see, I call anything that's sort of like a blues a blues, and some people think I'm crazy for doing that, but like the, the rinse and repeat is, a, I just call think it's a blues. Some other people are like, that's not a blues. I'm like, it's just a blues with some alternate changes. Um, so I like that one, that one's fun to play over. And then uh, No Arrival, that tune is cool. Stephen Feifke did a great big band arrangement of that. I gotta get that, I gotta find that. and. Uh, Bust that back out again. And then on the new record, cast characters, I think my favorite tune is, um, I like um, The Weatherman on there, and I like I like Venus too. I've been in kind of a contemplative, kind of quiet mode for a while here. Patience, patience. But Evolution of Perspective is another quasi-blues. I like that one too. Um, so and any of those, thoughts of using flugelhorn or trumpet to strengthen chops for trombone. Uh, they're different embouchures. I would not do it. I find trumpet gets in the way of trombone embouchure because it's all in the middle. Kind of, kind of gets in the way. I would go to tuba instead, go bigger rather than smaller. When do we know when is too much pressure on mouthpiece? If we have a t red ring, does that mean too much pressure? I saw red rings on very good musicians, but can't observe on me. Uh, yeah, man, that happens to me. I play. I mean, it's been a couple minutes since I stopped playing, but I get a red ring from playing for like two seconds. It has nothing to do. That has nothing to do with the amount of pressure necessarily. Too much pressure. I mean, as little pressure as possible is always. Um, ideal like too much pressure if you think you're playing with too much pressure then the answer is probably yes so you should try to play with less pressure i've had teachers suggest things like you know put the trombone on a stand or put the hang the trombone for this from the ceiling or imagine it's hanging from the ceiling and then you walk up to it and just put your lips up onto it and you should be able to make a sound right um, it just needs to have enough pressure that it seals like that that makes a seal around your chop so that you can actually make a sound that's the first thing. But if it's any more than that, then you're definitely probably playing with too much pressure. And I would recommend uh, chilling out. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, pressure is like a huge problem that a lot of people have and that they wanna like slam the horn into their face. Um, you just wanna play relaxed, you know? All the players that I've seen, you know, they look relaxed when they play. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna just try to be relaxed. Even if I'm not relaxed, you gotta be relaxed because, you know, I've. I've done plenty of gigs where I've slammed the horn into my face and trying to squeeze out a couple more notes or squeeze out a couple more minutes of playing, but it never ends well. <laughs> it never ends well. For me, what happens is that like kind of in the back of my nose, like the seal that prevents the air from coming out your nose while you're blowing out your mouth, whatever that's called, <laughs> it, br it like breaks or like leaks when I get super tired and there's too much pressure and too much tension. So that happened a lot like in my undergrad when I was at Eastman playing gigs, sometimes that would happen. Uh, and when I'm out of shape, it happens too. So it still happens, man, and for me. And I try to stay relaxed at all times, you know, like Steve Davis talks about taking like a baby breath, baby's breath and staying relaxed when you play. I think that that's just the key, man. Like for certain styles of playing, you gotta be a little more engaged for sure. Like if you need, if you want that laser focused kind of sound, you definitely need a m more engagement from the core and the air speed and the air column you know, um, really to kind of play that way more aggressively. I think that that's true also, but just to play, just to make sound, I think you want to be relaxed. You look at people on any instrument, like they look relaxed. The best, the best ones always look relaxed. They don't look all the time. Like it's going to be the death of them to play. You know, do you have other trauma models you use sometimes, or does the King 3B do pretty much everything you need? Yeah, so this goes to like a kind of a broader question of like, in my opinion, there's two schools of thought usually about equipment. And so the thought, the schools of thought are one, that you should play the right equipment for the right job, right? So you should play the equipment that matches the sound concept or whatever that needs to happen. And then there's another school of thought that says you should play consistently the same thing all the time and you should never switch. Um, I'm more of that second one. So I don't want to have horns that I have to feel like I have to switch. Obviously to double on bass trombone or to play with a trigger horn, like those are different tools for different situations sometimes. But 99 out of 100 gigs, I'm just gonna play that same horn. Um, and that's what I'm looking for in a horn that's important to me is it's not going to have one sound. It has to have the full array of possibilities, which is kind of why I've stuck with that horn, the 3B plus for a while now, because it has a range of possibilities. Um, smaller ones to me are a little too focused. 
bigger ones are a little too diffuse. This one is kind of in the middle and can have some of both. It also is not the best of both both worlds, you know, like it's it's not as focused as it would be on a 2B or 3B regular ones. And it's not as diffuse if you if it's a, as if I played a 548 or larger bore, 567, whatever. So you have to find what works for you. Um, I find that this is a good um, middle, middle of the road and it doesn't feel too big, you know. Some other ones like the 525 Shires I played feel big, felt bigger when I was playing that. But now that um, I've, I mean, it's been a while since then, but but this horn I've been playing since that record, The Chase. I got it like a couple weeks before I recorded that record and uh, I just haven't looked back. So the first record I recorded on, if you want to compare sounds, different. It's on my Edwards. I had an Edwards then. So it, that was a different time. But the Edwards is just like more covered and more kind of did one thing, you know the one thing really well but it didn't have the range of motion that i wanted it to have emotion not just motion but emotion does having a lower body weight affect your musicianship i think some people would argue that it does affect your sound and i think it did at first because it's less body weight it's less density how i mean it changes your sound at first I mean, you can work to get it back though that's what i had to do but that's purely observational i don't necessarily know that that's a real thing you know i think that's been the case for other people i've known that have lost a good deal of weight um they've also had not difficulty but just like an adjustment period to that new body mass like you it's just different you know you just have to get used to to making a sound and having more air with less you know density i guess but um ultimately i think um if you're not healthy and not at a weight where your body is um, in balance that uh, it's gonna lead to other problems like shoulder problems or neck problems, back problems, knee problems. I mean, all of that, any, it could happen to you anyway, regardless of that, but it's important to me. So that's why why I went on that, that journey then. That was a while, that was a long time ago now. How much preparation do you do when you've been asked to present a masterclass? At this point, not that much. And I only say that b because I've put in a lot of time thinking about it over the years, like literally since I started my master's, even before that. So in undergrad, in my undergrad and getting finished with my undergrad at Eastman, a friend of mine and I named Chris Teal, uh, we started something called the Institute for Creative Music. And it is a nonprofit that presents um, educational workshops focused around improvisation, focused around jazz, focused around creative music, kind of in a, in, in a, in a, wide, in a wide circle of uh, definition. And we did that because we felt like there was a lot of jazz musicians that were really great musicians who were in education, but who had never had any ed education training or thought about it in any kind of way, or as you were asking, prepared for their master classes and things of that nature. It was just sometimes it felt like, not to name anyone, and it's not about anyone in particular, but there were times when we experienced master classes that were just like, hello, I am great. Ask me questions, please. You know, they didn't have any point of view. So, and this is something when I'm um, consulting with artists, so we talk about like, what can you talk about that nobody else can talk about? What's your approach? What's your unique journey to that point that you could share with students that would either allow them to relate, give them a new frame of reference, offer them a, a different way of thinking about something? I've thought about this for a long time. Um, and I have, you know, four or five things that I like to talk about that I find are my talking points. Um, that I like to go to in terms of trombone, a trombone masterclass, a music business masterclass, an entrepreneurship masterclass, some combination of the th of all of that stuff, um, career masterclass, how to m release records, um, music marketing, all of those things are, are kind of all wrapped up into. I have outlines from all the, from the years past of. Like, okay, in a trombone masterclass, I want to hit on these things. These are the things that are important to me. In a jazz trombone masterclass, I'm going to hit on these things. Um, I have old PDFs of like things I wrote up with like descriptions of different types of classes I could give. Just coming up with an angle. It doesn't so much matter that it's like totally new or totally unique, but it's like it has to be some kind of angle that you can present that nobody else is going to or that nobody else would present it quite the same way. And obviously it's not revolutionary. Everybody's talking about a lot of the same things. Some kind, there has to be some kind of reason why somebody wants to bring you in for a masterclass, right? But at this point, I usually, I have a repertoire now of like pieces that I can play solo. That's important because I want to be able to play some stuff for the class. Um, and there's not always a rhythm section or not always a rhythm section that knows tunes. 
If there is, it's amazing. I have, you know, not a script, but kind of, you know, talking points at this point. I know my talking points, basically, and uh, I can kind of go through them and then open up for questions at the end or if people want to go in a particular direction and kind of keep it loose and casual. Or if it's more like, no, you need to talk and give a lecture. You know, I have, uh, you know, what I do for that. And uh, I'm always trying to relate it to things that are happening now and in my teaching and in when I find, oh, well, that doesn't really work super well, I'm gonna abandon that. But at this point, I've given enough classes that no matter what the age range is, I've probably given multiple master classes. And that's just because since I was in school, I would give as many master classes as I could, as many classes, not master classes, just teach as much as I could to different people, to get in front of new people, to figure out different techniques for teaching improvisation and jazz and trombone and uh, trying to figure out how to keep students engaged of different ages because that's a huge problem sometimes you get those middle school kids and trying to keep them on track and you're trying to show them something sometimes you just gotta be like all right let me just like play something to impress them and then uh, get back to talking about uh, long tones or whatever it might be so kind of just make an outline of what you might want to talk about and then think about like why should they bring you like what are you what unique value are you going to bring as opposed to anyone else you know you know, so something that I bring that people, other people don't bring is kind of a, an obsession with kind of a duality of like modern and old in my trombone, like jazz language approach and, and things of that nature. Thinking like you have to master both, like in, that's one thing. And then the freedom of expression is the freedom you gain by trombone technique. If you can't play the trombone, there's no way you're gonna be able to express yourself clearly. So that's number two. And then number three, the other thing that I like to talk about is what, however you wanna describe it, either music business or career, or just like taking the bull by the horns, as they say, and uh, making stuff happen. And how do you do that? And how do you put yourself out there? And how do you use all the available tools um, and, and talk about um, that side of the music industry at the same time. So it's how do you manage practicing all these important things and not get overwhelmed of them? You gotta take one thing at a time. If there's anything that I've learned, it's just you cannot do more than one thing at a time, no matter what. Like I, If I try to do more than one thing right now, I'm gonna get distracted. You gotta be doing one thing at a time. So the same thing goes with trombone. If I'm working on articulation, I gotta work on articulation. If I'm working on learning a tune, I'm working on learning a tune. You can only do one thing at a time and you keep leveling up. You keep leveling up your baseline for me. So that means fundamentals first, because if I don't have strong fundamentals, it doesn't matter how much crazy uh, technique I think I want to have because I won't have it. Right. And, and so I need to have those fundamentals, fundamentals, and then I need to have sound and then I need to have um, clarity of articulation to have clarity of rhythm and uh, freedom of expression. And no, that's going to take a long time. Like you can't think in short term with development on the trombone. It's it's long term on any instrument. It's uh, okay, the next six months, I'm gonna work on sounds. I'm gonna work on learning the piano. I'm gonna work on articulation. I'm gonna change my slide technique. It's like one thing at a time. How do you manage to velvety the staccatos, send a save to Brazil? Well, I'd love to come to Brazil. I just did a Brazilian masterclass a couple weeks ago. I'm gonna release that on YouTube soon that's in Portuguese. There's a translator, so if you are a uh, Portuguese speaker, you might enjoy that masterclass when it comes out on YouTube soon. Um, I'm not sure when exactly I'm going to release it, but it's recorded and it's edited, so it'll be out soon. But um, that might help you help you to understand my where I'm coming from with everything that I say. But um, velvety staccatos, you know, my teacher Steve Teray, he used to call that staccato, and so we would think about having the clarity of the front of the attack from a staccato note, and then you'd have the body of the note be legato, so it has a nice roundness, and then the the notes are separated still, staccato, right? So it, it's got front and end in a nice body. And then you practice doing that on every note. You practice scale exercises, articulation exercises, using um, those things to define the rhythm and, and the articulation. So think about that. So we got legato over here, staccato over here, staccato in the middle, and that's how we get a velvety I like how you put that. I like that. It's velvety. I'm having trouble balancing and playing my horn while using a plunger. Ah, yes. The eternal battle. Uh, my plunger's at school, so I can't demonstrate right now, but I can do my best. First of all, it's just a matter of balance of balance at any um, stage here. So you got to get uh, used to balancing the horn. This is how I do it, as if I was holding. So the weight goes in 
this part of your hand, the bottom part of your hand. Let me see. And then the plunger would go here, right? So you would want to hold it in the base of your palm, hold it up off your shoulder. If you try to go like this, you're going to get a crick in your neck. You're going to hold it up. So there's a certain amount of like pressure that you're putting with your arm so that it holds the trombone up, right? You hold it up into your neck a little bit so that it's like kind of bracing. But you're not pushing because that would, again, that would end up with a lot, a lot, a lot of pressure, which we don't want. And, but it's, it's just a matter of balancing. And I will say that in undergrad, when I was practicing that, trying to get used to doing the plunger, a pixie and plunger, it um, was uncomfortable for a long time. It's more comfortable now. And I used to even get like pain in my 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 forearm because I was holding it weird so you got to find a balance for you in how you hold the horn I like to say you know every single person needs to figure this stuff out for themselves I can give you pointers but ultimately I don't know what your body feels like so you need to figure out how to balance it you know um, if you're playing a trigger a horn a horn with an F attachment, it's probably too heavy, and that's probably giving problems as well. So if you can think about, <clears throat> you know, playing a straight tenor, that can always help. Get it up off your shoulder, hold it with the the base of your palm, and just know that you got to build up strength uh, to be able to hold it. Just get used to it at a certain rate. You know, no pain, no gain, as they say. Not that I advocate for pain, but. Uh, it is just the truth sometimes. I want to bring up to everyone's attention. Again, we have our Jazz Trombone Boot Camp that's open for registration uh, right now. And we're going to have really great guest artists, uh, including Steve Davis, Vincent Gardner, Andre Hayward, and Michael Davis. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's June 14th through 18th. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be on Zoom. I wish we could do it in person, but I don't think we're all going to know what's happening in June until June. So it's hard to make any in-person collaboration uh, thanks. So June 14th through 18th, website, nickfinzer.store. You'll see it. You'll find it. Do you have any experience with embouchure overuse? Yes, of course. Uh, and even with my students as well, it's something that happens. So what I like to think about is practicing in opposites. So if you have a hard day, then you need to practice easy. If you have an easy day, then you need to practice hard. Um, so you get used to the kind of the dichotomy of going back and forth. If you had a loud gig, you need to practice soft. If you had, a, If you've been playing a lot into a mute, if you've been playing really soft for a while, you need to go and play loud and use the, you know, practice in opposites, always in opposites, so that we're building up all the different facets of our playing. This goes back to being relaxed. This goes back to making sure that you're on uh, equipment that's comfortable and that you're not um, killing yourself to try to like make the sound that you hear. You know, that's why, I mean, for me, switching equipment is a last ditch effort. But at a certain amount, at a certain time, at a, cer at a certain time, you, you might have to switch equipment to um, get the sound that you're looking for and be able to sustain that. You know, a lot of people, maybe they go bigger, 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 and then they go back to somewhere in the middle because it has to be sustainable uh, for the long run. Uh, most of the problems I see with people with overuse is that they just play for they play too hard for too long on too big of equipment. So if you're playing hard and it's getting you're getting tired playing large equipment, you might want to switch to something easier or play less. And if that's not an option, maybe you want to switch to smaller equipment so it doesn't take as much effort to make a sound. But whenever there's overuse, I tend to go to whisper tones, long tones, and again, that practicing in opposites. So it usually means working on practicing really soft, which can be um, hard for some people because uh, they haven't done it before. With overuse, that's what I always go to. Whisper tones, long tones, take it easy, make sure you're practicing in opposites and just like give yourself a chance to build back up because your chops are a muscle just like any other muscle. And if you break it down, you gotta let them build back up. Um, so don't, uh, you, can't, you can't bust them down every day after day after day after day after day. Um, and so you, that might mean you have to be creative in the ways that you practice. It might mean that you have to be more on the piano some days. It's been great to chat with everyone today. March 5th, Friday, and uh, we'll be back next week uh, with another Q&A session. Maybe we'll play some uh, music for that on that session as well. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and um, we will catch you all very soon. And uh, as always, you can feel free to drop, drop questions throughout the week, and I'll uh, see if I can get to them on Friday. Take care. <laughs>